Hi, today I wanted to talk about a big mistake I find a lot of new business owners make. It's a mistake that I made many times, which is that we assume, firstly, we assume that someone is successful because of what their outward appearance is. That, and the second is that we assume that we can do better than the people who came before us. I'm not saying that we can't always do better than the people who came before us, but we need to do a little bit of basic math before we just jump into a situation. So, this is an old, old joke in the recording studio business, and it's how do you make a million dollars in the studio business? And the answer to that joke is you start with two. The whole idea being that uh, you don't make money in the recording studio business, is that you lose money. And the reason this joke became popular is because a lot of recording studios are really fancy looking. You walk in the room and you see the LA-2As, the LA-3As, the Neumann U87s, the Neve 8088 console, the expensive acoustic treatment, the beautiful fancy lounge, the expensive instruments, the Studer 800. And it's like, wow, you got a lot of stuff. That's amazing. Everybody thinks it's amazing that this million dollar studio exists. Nobody cares to think that they started with two. When I walk into a fancy studio, I don't think, wow, look at all the fancy stuff they have. I try to think, what is rent here? What are property taxes here? How much are you able to charge a day? How many people are willing to pay that rate that you charge a day? What do you pay your staff? And then put it all together to figure out, ugh, ugh, which is that, that little ugh being ugh, that loses money. And that's the way I want every single one of you to think when you start a business. Uh, and, and it's something that's going to happen over time. I never particularly considered myself a business person. I always used to say, I am a technician, or I, you know, I, or uh, whatever job I was doing at the time, I would consider myself that specific job. I never saw myself as a businessman. And as I kind of advanced on in my mid-20s, I slowly started to realize that this type of thinking was going on every place that I went. So uh, Mark Schaefer from iPad Rehab, this is a good example. He actually came up to New York um, about last year. And he wanted to go see this, there's one of these escape rooms, I'm not sure if you heard of these, it's like, you know, you go into the room and they have a puzzle and you have to solve the puzzle in order to get out of the room. And uh, when he, every, he went, and I was kind of a poor sport. Everybody there was trying to solve the puzzle. They were trying to find the clues, they were trying to see how they relate together. I wasn't paying attention to any of that shit. I was thinking to myself, okay, so here's how much the tickets to this event cost. Here's how many people are here. He has two other rooms. Here's how much the equipment in this room costs. He has one assistant out there, and this is about what, like 900 square feet, and this is on 34. Okay, so this is the expenses. This is how much. Now, how many times can he run this a day? Okay, so and I was trying to figure out how much money the guy made in this business to figure out if it was viable. And when you become a real business person, you're going to realize that you're kind of playing this game almost everywhere that you go. Uh, you know, almost any business that you walk into, you're just going to be like, you're just going to start automatically adding this stuff up in your head. And I, if you want to start a business, I want you to be in that mindset of adding all these things up in your head. I remember a long time ago, there was this one place that was getting a lot of business because they had just gotten into the into a major newspaper, and they decided to open other stores. And I'm like, damn, they're opening other stores. And damn, they're getting cars with their name printed on it and all this other stuff. So I thought, I'm going to do that because they have all these, you know, all these things that I don't have, and I guess that's what success is. But what I never bothered to do is ask myself, how many people are walking into the stores at these other locations? How many people would have gone to their original location anyway? How much value is the fact that you have a brand new car uh, bringing to your business in terms of deliveries? How many people are opting for that option? And what is your rent at these other locations? Is your rent payable at these other locations? Are you keeping quality up uh, what, since you have to manage four locations with the same principles that you have when you had one? And the answer to all of those was quite a negative one because they all closed within one calendar year. Within one calendar year of opening them all, they closed. And I had opened based on their model because their model seemed successful. But I had it because it looked successful at the time. But I never asked the proper questions to figure out if it was actually viable. And I wound up opening a store that failed because it was based on uh, what I, I thought somebody else was doing that was successful. I saw what they had. I thought, oh, I'm going to do that same thing because they have all this cool stuff. I never thought to ask myself, is all that stuff that they have financed by terrible um, chain and, you know, ball and chain around your neck debt? And it, it was a ladder. And the, uh, the other example is with a, uh, with a supply company that I had opened. I remember thinking to myself at one point in time, 
Uh, you know, I want, I'm, I think I can do better than them. I remember my dad had a conversation with me when I was younger. Uh, I was complaining about something, and he had said, there are two types of people. There are people that will complain when there's something that they don't like in the world, and there are people that will work or do something to change it. And most people, they go through their entire life barely scratching the surface of it, doing the bare minimum required to live. And then there are people that will actually work to change the things in the world that they don't like. So if there's anything about the world that you don't like, the only person at fault is you, because what have you done to try and change it? And that was a conversation he had with me when I was about five or six years old. And it got me into this idea of being a part of the change that I want to see in the world. So oh, a lot of these other businesses were complaining about the way the parts companies operated. They hated buying from them. There were no choices. I didn't like the way they operated. And I would complain. And I would think back to that conversation I had with my dad. And I would think, do I want to be that person that's barely scratching the surface of life, that gets to the age of 77, that's done nothing? And it's part of what I've tried to do with these uh, repair videos. I used to complain and say, there's no place to find information on component level repair online. There's no place that's going to give me even the slightest idea of what to do. All I see are, t are these you know, super high fast forwarded videos with techno music and no explanation and crappy camera angles. And that, whose fault was that but mine? Because what have I done to try to change it? And that, that, you know, that kind of motivated me to upload two or 300 board repair videos in long form format. And that motivated me to also start this supply company about seven years ago that sold you know, wholesale laptop LCD screens to other stores and also to end consumers. I didn't like that a lot of the supply companies that existed sucked. They always sold incompatible screens. If they were broken, they would treat you like crap sending them back. It was, it, they would sell stuff that was... Um, would often have stuck pixels, this, that, and the other. And I thought this sucked. I'm like, I can do better than this. And I, you know, I put my money and also I put a lot of somebody else's money where my mouth was, and that company completely failed. I realized after a period of time that what I wanted made some sense, but when you actually put the numbers together, it does not. Uh, so and firstly, in order to get sales volume, I needed to sell where I was making maybe a profit margin of between 1% and 5%. That, is, that, that, that does not allow me to hire people who will tell the difference between products or care. Uh, when you're making profit margins between 1% and 5%, you also, you, you're really limited in how nice you can be to the customer. So, you know, for me to offer you a return label immediately and then overnight you a new one, I thought that that was something that you should do. You should take responsibility for the customer experience. But can you afford to do that on the 1% to 5%? So you raise profit margins a little bit and then, hey, Nobody wants to buy. So while I thought, and this is, this is one thing I'm going to get into later, well, I thought that this would be valuable because a lot of people said, I really wish that somebody would start a company that did X, Y, and Z. When I started a company that did the same thing that everybody else did, it was not viable unless I treated people like crap. And then when I finally started doing X, Y, and Z, which was treating the customer better, having a higher standard a bar for the customer experience, all the people that said that they wanted that actually bought from everybody else. Because the reality is, saving that five or seven dollars was far more important to them than knowing that they could get an overnighted replacement if something didn't work right, knowing that it would come in a double box package so that it wouldn't break rather than a fucking envelope, knowing that I would be pre-testing it and plugging it in before I sent it, knowing that they were gonna get a part that was actually cross-compatible and not wrongly advertised as such because somebody who doesn't know what the hell they're doing is just copying and pasting from a spreadsheet. I, what I realized is that actually was not worth an extra $5. And one thing that happens with uh, if you're asking your friends or family about business ideas, and this is where people that you know and your best friends can be complete and absolute fucking bastards, is that they will tell you what you want to hear. They're going to be supportive because people think, you know, as a friend, I need to support what my friend is doing, or as a, you know, as a son or as a father, I need to support what my family member is doing. So they can say, oh, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Oh, yeah, I think you should get into that. Oh, yeah, I think you do a great job of that. And they say all that shit. And then you take out the $50,000 loan or the $100,000 loan to go in business only to realize that all those people who said that's a great idea would not be willing to spend their own money at your business. And this is, this is one of the things with capitalism that, that, that one of the, the things that I like about capitalism is that uh, the market will dictate what is somewhat, what is valuable and what is not valuable. So all these people saying, I think this is a good idea, at the end of the day, it's a good idea if people are actually willing to pay for your product or service. And, uh, you know, Eli the computer guy gets a lot of crap on his channel for being mean and being a wise ass and blah, blah, blah. But one of the things that I like about Eli and one of the things that I, I'm, I'm, um, 
I'm making a, a leap here, and he can correct me if I'm wrong, is that I feel like if his best friend came to him with an idea that he thought wasn't the best idea, he's not going to pat him on the back and say, yeah, I think, that, I, I think you should go for that. I'll be supportive. I feel like he would just tell him, no, that's terrible. You're not going to make money doing this. Here's why I believe you're not going to make money doing this. That's a stupid fucking idea. Don't do that. And then that they'd be able to laugh and have a beer. Now, a lot of people are going to tell you that they think that your idea is great. Uh, when you're, you know, oh yeah, you should get into that and be supportive because they think it's cool. But your, even your best friends, your mother, your father, your aunt, your cousin, your wife, your husband, they're not going to tell you when your idea sucks, when your idea has, is not viable, and when they're not going to crunch the numbers in their head. And even if they do, very often they're not going to tell you because they're afraid that you're going to react poorly. Your really good friends are the friends who are going to tell you when your idea is not financially viable, is not an idea that they think people are going to pay for. And again, a lot of people, they want better service. They want better quality. They want this, that, and the other. But then when you actually offer it, eh, I know I was bitching about it because it annoyed me right now. Do I really want to pay $5 extra a piece? Nah. And I'm guilty of this too. I, I, when I was younger, I've told people, oh yeah, that's a great idea. You should try that. Because, you know, it sounds good in my head. It sounds good in the, you know, in the, in the cotton carry and the cotton candy and the fairy dust in the sky. There's this uh, nice idea of, of like, yeah, you should open a studio that does this, that, and the other. That, that's great. I think that's a good idea. And it sounds great because we want it to succeed. We want it to be something that's successful. But in reality, if people are not willing to pay for it, it ain't successful. And this brings me to a restaurant that I've been talking about in a lot of these, these videos that I do. Uh, there's this place that I, I've called the real estate agent. It costs anywhere between forty to 60000 bucks, depending on when I, when I call. There's this restaurant, and it goes out of business every six months to a year. It's, it's, uh, on my, it's on my way from the walk to the store to Union Square. Every single six months to a year, it goes out of business. Sometimes it's a small little uh, hipster coffee shop with sandwiches. Sometimes it's a, uh, just a health food store or a healthy sandwich shop, stuff like that. And what, what, what happens is this. The place is too small to be a fancy, large restaurant that gets a lot of people and makes a lot of money. However, it's also too, just too large to be one of those hole-in-the-wall, $4,000 to $10,000 a month places that can rake in money but still pay their rent. Because, you know, you got those small burrito places, those small sandwich places that are like $6,000 to $12,000 a month, and the owners can profit off that. And then you got the nice fancy restaurants that are in the forty to 60000 rent range, and they can profit off that. This, uh, I mean, this one is just in that range where it's slightly too small to be a nice fancy restaurant uh, or, have, or house a lot of people, but it's also much um, too large to have reasonable rent. Again, it's going to be in that forty to $60,000 range. And every single year, somebody with this human hopefulness comes to this restaurant and thinks, I'm going to open here and I'm going to make money. Somebody was open here before, right? And they always think to themselves, somebody was open here before, right? But do you know what they never think to themselves? Why did they fucking fail? Why are they not here now? I wish more people would think like that. I wish more people would just add things up and do the numbers and look and go, okay, well, and they were open. They had this many people walk in during lunchtime. They had this many people walk in during breakfast. They had this many people walk in during dinner. Here's the prices that they were charging. Here's the amount that rent costs. Here's how many employees I'm going to have to pay to have a restaurant. Does this make sense? And if the answer is no, don't open. Go through this in your head before you take out a $100,000 loan, before you put yourself in debt for the rest of your life, before you ruin your life savings. And have, I just want you to think a little bit about these things. And don't assume that your business is going to be successful just because somebody else's is successful. The, per, the other restaurants in the area, they may be successful because they're paying. You may say, oh, look, they have a restaurant. Why can't I have a restaurant? Or they have a coffee shop. Why can't I have a coffee shop? Maybe that coffee shop is paying 10000 in rent while you're paying 40000 because you have this much more space. Maybe that place has a customer base that they've built up over the 50 years that they've been open that you don't have. So when you open, even if you make better stuff, the people are like, eh, is it really worth it to walk over there and try it? Maybe, maybe not. I want you to think about these things. Because if you assume that you're going to be successful just because somebody else was in that place and had success, you're going to fail. And the reason that this drives me nuts is because that, the only reason that place is forty to $60,000 rather than being worth the fucking 15000 that it actually should be is because there's always somebody willing to pay for it. And it's kind of like stocks. Like a stock is only worth what people are willing to pay for it. 
if I'm not willing to buy a stock at a dollar, you could have you could have your ask set at a hundred. But if nobody in the world is willing to buy it for more than a dollar, yeah, it's worth a dollar. And the same is true with rent. If nobody is willing to rent a space, then you can ask sixty thousand bucks. You could say it's sixty thousand bucks, but it ain't going to be worth sixty thousand dollars. And I'm sick of walking around the East Village. I'm sick of walking around Midtown Manhattan. I'm sick of walking around the Lower East Side and seeing all these little restaurants and all these little stores that open and then three months later go out of business, only for a new person to come in and for it to go out of business. Because everybody thinks I'm going to do better in this space than the last person. I'm going to do better than this space. I have a better. Oh yeah, I know that they had a decent restaurant, but I have better food. I know that they had decent products, but I have better customer service is selling them, which is why I'll succeed. No. It's the fact that you're paying $40,000 for a hole in the wall. That is the problem. And I, I, I want you to just take down the ego a little bit, take down the overconfidence, take the, either the, the human hopefulness down one notch, and just take the, the, um, the uh, actuary up a notch. Start counting. Start adding up figures. And, try to fi and, and, and be honest with yourself. Is the reason that they failed because they're idiots and you're a genius, or is the reason they failed just because market realities dictate that this is ridiculous? And I want more people who run businesses in Manhattan or more people who want to open businesses in Manhattan to think like this before they go balls to the wall and you know, spend their life savings or take out a huge loan. Because here's the thing, you know, the rent keep going up and up and up and up, and the city keeps charging more and more and more in property tax, which encourages the landlords to make the rent go up and up and up, which but the thing is, this would not be sustainable. This could not continue to happen unless people, how do I put this? This could not continue to occur if people simply did math and then said, you know what? No, I'm not taking that space. I know it's open and it's a nice location, but fuck that. That's a tiny space and that's $60,000 a month. I'm not going to go bankrupt. I wish more people would think like this because then it would bring the demands for these spaces down, which would then bring the prices down, which would then make prop maybe property tax would stop going up so much every year, which would then create a more sustainable environment for businesses where somebody could actually open in this space and stay there longer than six months to a year and not fail. But as long as we have all these Tom, Dicks, and Harrys that are willing to you know, just dump their life savings into a space with this human hopefulness without you taking out a calculator once, uh, we have this environment where, eh, I fucked up my sentence. We have this environment where they're just going to keep getting away with it. The rents are going to stay high. The businesses are going to go out of business every six months to a year. And we're going to have a city that's overrun with Chase, Starbucks, and Sartander. And I don't want to live in a city that's nothing but Chase, Starbucks, and Sartander. Because every block you see, it, Chase, Starbucks, Sartander, Chase, Starbucks, Sartander, Chase, Starbucks, Whole Foods, Chase, Starbucks, Trader Joe's. It's like, it's this, New York City is becoming the same shit over and over again. And all these small shops and all these places that could actually succeed if rent was 20000 but cannot succeed when it gets j hiked up to $80,000. they are all going away. And, that's that, and those little small shops are what make this city w why people want to move here. This, that, you know, that's what gives the city its culture. That's what gives the city its personality. And that's why people come here. People are not going to move here 10 years from now if this entire city is just Chase, Starbucks, Sartander, Whole Foods, Trader Joe's, same shit over and over again. But that's what it is quickly becoming. And I think that the answer to this is to scale back on people who are willing to dive in and assume that they are going to be successful because it's a cool location and because there's two other locations in the area that are successful. I don't want you to look at, the, at this coffee shop next to yours and go, they're successful, therefore I'm going to be successful. I want you to think to yourself, how in debt are they to be in that location? How far in debt did they, you know, the same way I opened a shop because I saw this other place opening a bunch in the same area. I thought, I'll open a second one. I never thought to myself, how many hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt did they go to look successful? When you walk into a successful business, I don't want you to just think about, wow, look at how nice it is. I should open up the same thing. I want you to think to yourself, is this viable? I want you to do the same thing that I did when I went to that uh, escape room with Mark Schaefer, where instead of paying attention to the actual escape, uh, all I thought the entire time I was there is, what's their rent? How much does all this equipment cost? How much does that monitor cost? How much is he paying that receptionist out there? How many rooms can he do at a time? How much does he pay in advertising? I want you to think about all that before you open a business, because I want to see more sustainable businesses. I want to see more sustainable practices. And frankly, I want to see this city have some chance to not become a complete shithole over the next 10 years that's just completely owned by banks and large chains.